Agus Anish, uh, can I call on the, one of the honorary presidents of the Irish Labour History Society, Francis Devine, uh, to set the scene uh, on the Irish delegation of the International Labour Organization um, before we have the, the discussions, Patricia O'Donovan and Jerry Finnegan, on the admission of the new state into the League of Nations and membership of the International Labour Organization, which will be chaired by Mary E. Daly from University College Dublin. Francie. Okay, I'm going to turn this slightly because I want to be looking at the screen. Uh, which, which one do I press? Screen one. Okay, just explaining my technophobia. Uh, first of all, uh, delighted to be here and uh, just uh, pay tribute to Jack and uh, Kevin and the committee for organizing such a tremendous event. I'd also like to remember uh, those that are still with us, Fergus Darcy, Ken Hannigan, Gregor de Duel, Paragus Noddy and Fintan Cronin, who are the remaining uh, surviving members of the, of the first uh, ILHS committee. It's my function today here just to give a very brief introduction. I'm going to be followed by people that are a lot more expert than I am, but it relates to the Irish delegation to the ILO in 1923. Uh, the ILO was part of the League of Nations that was founded in 1919, and it had as a metaphor, whereas universal uh, lasting peace can only be established if it is based on social justice. An expression worth reflecting on in 2023, bearing in mind that it's over a century and that would still be not a bad metaphor for the uh, working class across the globe. The Irish uh, labor movement, however, had already, if you like, represented Ireland at an international conference, namely that in Bern in 1919, Thomas Johnson to become leader of the Labour Party and Carl O'Shannon attended taking the democratic program with them. Uh, that program is online on the ILHS website uh, as a document produced by the ATUC. They got recognition as a delegation separate to that of, of Britain. Uh, and they also, as you can see, reading through the rest of that, managed to establish a, a recognition of, of Ireland as its place among the nations. However, when the ILO was founded, sorry, when the League of Nations was founded, uh, that obviously was the first occasion that Ireland was able to be represented as a country at an international body. But the first occasion that they actually, if you like, exercised that was at the ILO in uh, 1923. The delegation was J.B. Whelan on behalf of the government, R.C. Ferguson, who was an established and uh, much uh, uh, honoured civil servant, and a woman called Bernadette Stafford who acted as advisor. She's a most interesting woman and a nice MA thesis for somebody because she was a, a factory inspector. There weren't very many women involved at that level at that stage. So she later wrote uh, quite an extensive survey of Ireland and the ILO. The workers delegation, sorry, the employer was William Hewitt. The workers delegation was Johnson again, Thomas McPartland and RJP Mortishead. We'll say a little bit more about each of those as we go through. Here they are. On the left-hand side, Thomas McPartland, who was the leading figure in, the, in, the, in Ireland of the Amalgamated Society of Woodworkers, uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, Johnson. These were the worker reps that attended throughout the 1920s, and it's not particularly relevant to us today, but just to pick out a couple of them. One of them, Luke Duffy, I'll say a little bit more about in a few minutes, but you can see that the advisor was almost always uh, RJP Mortishad, who finishes up as uh, a full-time official in the ILO. On the left-hand side, one of those that represented us was Dennis Cullen. Now, the reason I put Dennis Cullen up there is because he was the general secretary immediately preceding John Swift, the general secretary of the Irish Bakers, Confectioners and Amalgamated Workers Union, uh, and the founding president of our society. And Dennis was also a member of the society. And on the right-hand side, we see Mortishad. Now, the delegates to the ILO, it must have been an amazing experience because in those days, they went for two weeks. They went by train and boat, so the whole procedure. It wasn't getting a, a, a quick flight from Dublin Airport. 
and there was a lot of work involved. They were there from sort of very early in the morning until quite late at night. But they obviously took pride, and pride was taken in them in representing uh, the, new, the new state at, at such a body. They had a clear commitment to improving workers' conditions, nationally and internationally, and were quickly distinguished and commented on by other delegates for the contributions that they made. And the reports that they made back to the ITUC, you might even say were disproportionate. There's a cynic might say they gave a lengthy report to justify the fact that you've gone for a fortnight, which must have seemed a very uh, elaborate and, and thrilling thing to do. But there was a very strong concern that they wanted to make uh, sure that the uh, Irish movement was uh, au fait with what was taking place. The elements that they looked at, this is again 1923, so it just shows you how the agenda hasn't really changed very much, were hours of work and eliminating night work, women's equality in a whole variety of ways from equal pay to equal treatment, protection of young and vulnerable workers, particularly plantation workers, seafarers, and what Mar uh, Marcel mentioned, indentured and slave workers, a uh, phenomenon that are probably more common now or as common as they were in 1919, workers' compensation, and of course, freedom of association. These were the ILO conventions, which I don't intend to leave on the screen for very long, but you can see most years uh, the conventions took uh, were adopted and were uh, usually on fairly basic things, not always in relation to uh, Ireland, for example. Uh, one of the most interesting ones there is the fifth one down, the Inspection of Immigrants Convention, which again is perhaps uh, something of relevance today. The Irish delegates were considered, not by themselves, but by outside commentators, to be diligent and hardworking, technically uh, demanding of themselves and of the people around them. There were complaints within the movement here of a lack of women being sent when women's issues were being discussed, uh, our, or specialist uh, unions, for example, when there was a discussion of a convention on seafaring. J.H. Bennett of the National Union of Seafarers, of seamen, I should say, complained that no uh, maritime delegate had been selected. There was a commitment in our delegations to recognition, to collective bargaining, to maximum hours and equal pay, uh, and the impact of all of this, in Ireland anyway, was limited by the ongoing uh, or uh, oncoming uh, recession, government disinterest, uh, and political in in impotence. On the employer side, on some years, they didn't even send anybody to the ILO, which underlined their lack of commitment. I've just realized I can see the thing down here. Sorry about that. This is uh, just a, f a fact sheet as to when Ireland actually adopted the various uh, conventions now, a bit like uh, European legislation, we're very good at acknowledging the directive, we're not necessarily very good at then implementing it by way of uh, local statutes. But that was some of the impact uh, in the 20s, and it could be argued that that impact on those social issues wouldn't have been as acute without the ILO and the attendance at the ILO. The key figure that I'm sure uh, Patricia uh, and Ray will talk about more was Edward Phelan, the Waterford man uh, born in Tramore, who finished up as a British civil servant, and from that, through the First World War, was involved in the drafting of the ILO uh, constitution, and as you can see, becomes uh, a holder of a number of posts, including director. Now, he, he was, from the Irish point of view, a friend at court, uh, and quite clearly kept the Irish delegates and the Congress executive uh, abreast of what was taking place, and took pride in uh, addressing the ITUC on a number of occasions. And I'm gonna finish with one of his quotations. He used those occasions to praise the Irish worker representatives, uh, particularly Luke Duffy and the aforementioned uh, Dennis Cullen, making the point that when uh, one of them criticized the Americans' lack of implementation of the Hours Directive, it was reported more, uh, more widely across America than any other contribution, again, perhaps reflecting some of what Marcel talked about in terms of the Irish-American influence in the labor movement. But the key and uh, poignant figure in 1923 was Thomas McPartland. Thomas McPartland, as you can see, was born in Sligo in 1879, family moved to Dublin, and he became active in the Amalgamated Society of Carpenters and Joiners, later the ASW. Served on the ITUC executive for over 10 years, was president in 1917, he was an officer of Dublin Trades Council and as such addressed the British TUC special conference on uh, 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 the 1913 uh, lockout in September, sorry, on the, uh, the ordinary TUC uh, in September 1913. This was the statement from the 
uh, ITUC under a report for 1924, uh, and it underlines what an impact his death had. A gloom was cast over Ireland's entry into its first official international conference. His family, there were nine kids, suffered a grievous bereavement, and the Irish labor movement lost the services and comradeship of a wise and trusted leader. The homecoming of the remains was made the occasion of a public funeral of a unique character, which testified to the respect and affection in which Mr. McPartland was in, uh, inspired. Not only among the trade union officials and the members of the Oireachtas who had worked with him in public affairs, but also among the thousands of trade unionists who marched in the funeral procession and lined the streets and attended the funeral mass in the Pro Cathedral. This is uh, a picture taken from the Freeman's Journal of the funeral uh, cortege, which as you can see is very stately and very, uh, you know, very somber. It amounted effectively to a state funeral because there on the, on your right, I think as you're looking at it, no, on the left, sorry, is uh, Richard Mulcahy. And uh, in the middle there is W.T. Cosgrave, president of Sestad Aaron. So it was uh, a pretty big event that the Voice of Labour, the Transport Union weekly paper, carried huge uh, respectful uh, editorial to him and they reprinted his TUC address from 1917. He died of a heart attack in his hotel room in Geneva uh, on the 20, 20th of October 1923, uh, aged, there's a digit missing, aged 44. Uh, the tragedy of it is, here is a man who is distinguished as a representative of the new state, and yet the trade union movement had to set up a dependence fund for his widow and his nine kids, which again maybe tells you something about the role. The contrast on the side was the cartoon uh, from the Irish worker of the Voice of Labour that week about the increasing payments effectively for directors' fees, etc. How things have changed. So it was Irish Labour on an international stage. There was a commitment to fairness at work and justice in society, if I can borrow an expression from SIPTU. There was a commitment to workers across the globe, something that perhaps underlines one of our great failures and an implicit failure maybe in Marcel's paper, that whereas capitalism has globalized successfully, we have not been able to respond to that in any organized globalized fashion. And the ILO, rather than being a central of people's attention, has become something that doesn't even make the six, six o'clock news. There wasn't the same commitment from government or employers, nothing may be changed there too much, but the Irish contribution uh, to, the, to the ILO, certainly in the 20s, was one that uh, generated an amount of praise. This is um, a feeling again, almost like a Hollywood style photograph there with a the fag in the mouth. Uh, and I wanted to finish with this quotation from Phelan to the uh, Dublin ITUC uh, annual meeting in 1927. And I think the first line of it underlines really why the ILO and international action on behalf of the working class globally remains important. The battle is very far from being won. You helped us in the first chapter and we hope that your delegates who come to us will help us in the struggle. I trust that you will take my presence here as a manifestation of the fact that we in Geneva try not to be entirely shut in by the Alps and the Jura. If we are going to achieve practical results, we must also achieve personal contact. And I think that underlines perhaps a challenge for all of us as Marcel has led, that we should re be remain, re remember always that we are part of an international movement for international justice and peace. Maham Mook or Francie? Um, anybody with any comments or questions before we let Francie go? No? Over there. Top of the right. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. David Joyce is my name David. from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. And I am the current worker rep at the ILO, so I just wanted to say hello. And thanks to Francie for that really excellent presentation. And I suppose, reflecting on what he said near the end there, um, if we really do want to revitalize 
Ireland's um, engagement with the ILO, it has to start in our movement because nobody else will, will do it. So um, I really look forward to the discussion with Patricia and Jerry, and thanks, Francie, again. Thank you, David. And Danella? Yeah. Just very quickly to respond to David, tomorrow uh, in Nernie's Court uh, at 5.15, I think it is, we're showing the film A Race to the Bottom, which was an ICTU film made some years ago. David will do the introductions. Uh, basically, it was inspired by Neil Carney, uh, Burn Cranor man, who finished up working for the Taylor and Garment Workers Union in the UK. And when he was home in Donegal Derry, he wondered what had happened to the shirts and followed them to Bangladesh. That's basically what the film is about. When he got there, he discovered they'd gone further east to Southeast Asia. Uh, he gave his life to Bangladeshi workers, and there's a statue in his honor uh, in Dhaka, uh, uh, an amazing man. But the film is about 20 years old now, but still very relevant. So that's at 5.15 with David tomorrow in Nernie's Court. Okay, colleagues, uh, could I ask for a bull of bulls, Harla?